something go? No, you're fine. I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure that my volume's not up like it was like last time. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. We already, it already started again, just like always. Hey, y'all. It's Tony Maurer here from Ropes and Wings. And we have the usuals. We have Heather Hank from Quantum Healing Within. We have Kaz from Journeying Soul Therapy. And of course, our very special, awesome guest, we have Jerry Marzinski. And Jerry's a retired licensed physical therapist over with over 40 years experience working with I'm and not studying. A, not, a, not a physical therapist. Oh, shoot. Psychotherapist. <laughs> Good gracious. <laughs> Look at I screwed that up. Those guys work with feet and stuff. Off, off you to know, a good start. You, you know what, Jerry? Instead of me no, reading, no, go of ahead. Re just go ahead. Finish <laughs> it up. Instead of me reading this, why don't you introduce yourself? That'd be better. You go ahead and introduce yourself. Yes. All right. Let me. Let me. I'll, I'll. Let me find the same sheet you do, so I don't forget uh, any of this stuff. <laughs> All right. Well, if you don't have it, I'll read it. All right. Yeah. Go ahead and finish it up. Okay. So Jerry's a retired licensed psychotherapist with over 40 years of experience working and studying with the thought processes of psychotic and criminally insane patients in some of the most volatile psychiatric institutes in the nation. Jerry's a commercial pilot. He's a certified scuba diver, long distance motorcyclist. He has held positions as a second lieutenant in the Arizona Civil Air Patrol and assistant scoutmaster. He was awarded the state of Arizona's Notorious Service Award and the Pima College Apple Award of Teaching Abnormal Psychology. His formal academic training comprises of a bachelor's in psychology from Temple University, a master's in counseling from University of Georgia, and two years of study in the PhD psychology program He's the co-author of An Amazing Journey into the Psychotic Mind, Breaking the Spell of the Ivory Tower, and is currently has a private practice in Arizona. So, Jerry. That's, I can't, I can't that's remember good. all that stuff. Well, I, so. <laughs> I usually uh, forget about uh, half of it. So, wow, I mean, that's amazing. It, it's a pleasure for me to have you on our show too, because you and your research and what you've done for all these years ties in what we do in, in quantum healing hypnosis and talking to the voices. And it's just confirmation that what we're doing is, is working. So I know, yeah. why don't you go ahead and just tear off and just, just well, yeah, yeah I've, run, I've run into the same. I, uh, you know, I, I didn't know you could talk to these things at first. Um, you know, when I first went to work, uh, after, after master's program, I, I was employed at the largest psychiatric hospital on the planet. I mean, they had like 10,000 psych patients there down from yeah. about 23. <clears throat> they had 200 buildings there. It was the size of a small city and it sprawled over, I think like 3000 acres. There were 30,000 patients buried in the graveyard alone. And it had been around since before the Civil War, mm. so there was there was every every kind of mental illness known to man in there, and uh, you know I, I didn't know at the time like we were talking about that the uh, medical and mental health system had already been taken over by the Rockefellers and the Carnegie Foundation back in 1910, mm. and that they were ordered to teach. Uh, um, what is it? Uh, drug, drug based medicine, pharmaceutical yeah. based medicines. So uh, like everybody else, I was programmed in uh, in college to believe that uh, the, the DSM, the Directory of Mental Illnesses, was the Bible and that all these things were real, you know, that they they were actual mental disorders. Um, I had no idea at the time. I mean, and, and even even all the way through school from from undergraduate to master's to Ph.D. and the Ph.D., they treated the DSM like a Bible. I mean, it was like this was the word of God as far as uh, the mental health goes. I had no idea that they made up all those mental illnesses completely fabricated. You wow. know, they, it started off with about 97 and now it's at, uh, I think, 200, 297 or something like that. It's approaching 300. 
and they have this this body of uh, psychiatrists that meet once every few years, two thirds of which are in league with big pharma. And what they do is they, they I've been told it was like a, a tobacco barn where they come in, they go, hey, I got a new mental illness. And he, they read off the mental illness and they all vote on it to see if, if it's something to pharma, you know, the pharmacy people can make a drug to treat. And if it does, they, they pass it. But, you know, two thirds of those people who are making these things up are uh, associated with big pharma. You know, so <clears throat> there's not a there's not a physical test for any of them. You know, uh, there's no lab work. There's no EEG. There's no EKG. There's no nothing. It's um, you know, all the, all their entries are impressive looking things. I mean, they're you know, uh, schizophrenia. You know. 303.05 and all these subdirectories and all that kind of stuff. But the, the truth is there's a doctor, uh, Julian Whitaker. He said that every single one of these mental illnesses were fabricated by breaking up segments of human behavior and pathologizing them. There are no blood tests, there are no lab tests, there are no x-rays, there's no EEGs, not a single test to validate even one of these diagnoses, they're just classes of behaviors that groups of psychi that a group of psychiatrists have voted to be a mental disorder. Mm. So it, it's one of the biggest shams that uh, psychiatry and psychology ever ever put over on the on this planet. And uh, you know, some of the uh, what they do is they uh, almost all human behavior is is can, is a mental illness according to them a child who talks back a man who spends too much time on the internet a woman who grieves at her death of her husband for more than 2 weeks they're all labeled as mentally ill and need to be drugged you know unhappiness is labeled depression people are encouraged to numb themselves with these drugs instead of dealing with life and, and some of these crazy diagnoses they have are mathematics disorder, caffeine intoxication disorder, sibling relational disorder, you know, kids fighting with each other, sexual orientation disturbances, homosexuality. And here's, here's some of the cream of the crop here, Florence syndrome, being overwhelmed by beauty, such as in Florence, Italy. The symptoms are fainting and dizziness. The treatment is antidepressants. Oh. Paris syndrome. What? Yeah, these are in the DSM. So this That's this insane. is what you're dealing with. That's and crazy. These, these, these people the, wanting the, to control everything just have free reign to make up whatever they want to make up. Yeah. And they put it in this book that they charge a fortune for. Right. And the insurance companies use it. They have to they have to use these diagnoses to collect insurance from the companies. Hmm. You know, and then the universities are teaching this bull. And, and all the all the universities. So these people come out believing that these things are actual mental illnesses and that they're separated as cleanly as they have them in the DSM. And that includes uh, psychosis. So the, the one of the winners is the Paris syndrome, mostly mostly experienced by Japanese visiting France. Symptoms include depression, anxiety, <laughs> feelings of persecution which uh, would have been normally uh, before the DSM be called cultural shock, you know? There's okay, probably you've blown my mind. Pill. There's probably <laughs> a pill just for that. <laughs> like, here's the one. And these things are growing every year. In 1952, there was uh, 106 psychiatric disorders. In 1980, there were 256. They vote them in, they vote them out. DSM-5 has 297, you know? And... They're all fabricated, all of them. Jerry, is this book, uh, is it just American or is it worldwide? Oh, no, it's, it's worldwide. Okay. You know, they publish it. They're making a fortune off of it because they're teaching it in the universities. So, you know, the Rothschilds have taken over the universities and, and they fund what they want, you know, the drug companies want published. And uh, they, they, you know, don't don't pay for it. So they'll pay for their own research. They, they virtually control the universities. The pharma call, the, the big pharma controls what's being taught in the universities. So these psychiatrists coming out, they come out believing that, you know, schizophrenia and the voices that these people hear are hallucinations. Mm -hmm. They've done no research on that whatsoever. They just declare it. 
Mm. Yeah. Well, so, I would love to know when, when did you start to notice if there was something a little off with the schizophrenia and the voices and, and putting together that it's not what they're saying, but there's something else going on here. Well, that was when, see, they, 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 you, you can't get access to a clinical population while you're in college. I have right. never, ever, ever seen a researcher on the front lines of anywhere I worked. And I've worked in a lot of frontline places, you know, uh, mental health centers, uh, emergency rooms, uh, so private psychiatry. I mean, the whole gamut. I, I've worked in every single mental health, you know, program, hospital system there is in the U.S. I've seen them all. I've never ever seen a researcher allowed to enter onto the front lines to do research. Yeah. And and during college, we could not get access to these populations. So I was always distrustful of authority. And, you know, the stuff they were teaching in college was like, you know, just just memorize it and regurgitate it. You know, yeah. you know, trust us, this is the truth. And, and that always sat uneasy with me. So the first time I started noticing uh, oddities between what they were saying and teaching and, and uh, um, you know, my own doubts as to you know, the, the authority was uh, looking at the back of the textbooks, the psychology textbooks. And, and you, look at, you look at that and it, it's the references. This guy got the information from this guy who got the information from that guy who got it from this guy who got it from this guy. And it's almost like if enough guys agreed to publish whatever this one guy wrote, it would become truth. Yeah. You know, but there's no way for the student to get out there and check these things out. There's, you couldn't say, the only place you could check out anything in psychology was in the rat lab with experimental psychology where you, you can actually work with the, the, the rats and watch the behavior materialize, but not anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And abnormal psychology, which I was fascinated with, would only give descriptions of these different mental illnesses. There was nothing about how to treat them other than with drugs. There was no psychotherapy. You know, like at, at the end of each one of those DSM things, there wasn't anything about, about treating them. It's all revolving around drugs. You know, all other treatments were knocked out. Now, if you tried to use conventional psych psychotherapy with schizophrenics, it's like shooting a, uh, a rhino in the butt with a BB rifle. So that was the first thing I noticed is, is how these guys publish or perish. They would publish anything, you know, just to get published. And here's this list of references in the psych books, you know, where they were, they were t taking ideas from each other. It was like intellectual incest. The next big one was in clinical uh, abnormal psychology in undergraduate school, this one clinical psychologist published a paper that we were requested to read or told to read in abnormal psychology, which basically said if two crazy guys with the same um, you know, mental disorder had the same delusion, like if both of them thought they were Macron, you know, one of them would have to give up that delusion. And I'm like, and why would that have to happen? You know, even as an undergraduate, like, why would one of them have to give up their delusion to the other one? It, it makes no sense. They're both crazy. They both have their own delusion. They're operating in individual worlds. I mean, that didn't make any sense. But here's this clinical psychologist writing this paper. And I tucked it in the back of my head. And uh, fast forward uh, another eight or nine years when I was at this big psychiatric hospital, Central State Hospital. I was on the second ward of the psychiatric unit. I was doing my rounds. And here's this uh, patient carrying on a conversation with somebody or something that I couldn't see. And I was taught that hallucinations, I thought they were word, you know, like word salad. They didn't make any sense, just babble garbage. No, but I'm, I'm watching these guys talk to somebody carrying on like a one-sided conversation like you're hearing somebody talking on a telephone you could hear what they're saying but you can't hear what's coming back mm -hmm. you know and and the parts that i was able to hear were perfectly coherent you know they were arguing with whatever this thing was you know they were talking and it was it was full-fledged sentences and paragraphs it wasn't word salad like i was led to believe 
you know, and of course they don't go into the, the uh, hallucinations anywhere in psychology. They just say they're hallucinations, you know, um, and, and they might say ideas of reference and, you know, kind of general categories, but they, they just blow them off. So that's the first thing I noticed was that whatever these people were talking to, it wasn't word salad. It wasn't like regular hallucinations where they're just all over the place and they're not making any sense. All right. So I crept up on this guy and I was trying to listen to what he was trying to say. And uh, he caught me. So uh, I turn and he turns around and he sees me standing there. And I tell him, hey, I'm Jerry. I haven't seen you before. I'm the psych for this unit. Uh, what's your name? And he looks at me in the eye and he says, I'm Jesus Christ. Oh. And I look at him and I say, you know, I'm thinking back. And uh, I say, no, you can't be Jesus Christ because I am. <laughs> and I'm sitting there waiting to see what he does. You know, it's like I was on pins and needles. Like, what's he going to do? What's he going to do? And he's standing there. And he's like thinking, you know, and I'm like, is he going to is he going to break? Is he going to change? What's he going to do? You know, and then he looks at me and he goes, uh, OK, we can both be Jesus Christ. And I'm like, they freaking lied to me. <laughs> they lied to me. And he strolls off like just happy as a clam, you know, talking <laughs> to whoever he was talking to before. And I'm thinking, what else did they lie to me about? You know, so uh, I'm looking around and and the most the most uh, disruptive, the most fascinating of the bunch of patients that we were dealing with in the, the psychiatric rehab center I was working in were the schizophrenics. They were usually the most intelligent when they could hold it together. They were able to learn stuff, but they were hearing voices and nobody knew what they were. You know, so I would ask staff, what are these things? Oh, they're hallucinations, they're hallucinations. There were, there were probably hundreds, if not thousands of staff at this place. I mean, it was huge, it sprawled over acres, 200 buildings, you know, these massive psychiatric buildings. Not one of them was interested in what the voices were or what they were saying. They were all brainwashed in graduate school or, or college to believe that they were hallucinations and just ignore them. And I don't know how many times I heard psychiatrists tell the patient, oh, they're just, they're just hallucinations, just ignore them. And I remember calling one back about a week later after a psychiatrist had told him that. I, I asked him, I said, well, you know, the psychiatrist told you to ignore these things. How's that going for you? He said, it's not going well. They won't be ignored. They get louder. And so I checked that out with the rest. So every time I got a bit of information like that, there was this unlimited supply of schizophrenics there. I mean, I had I had all of them I could ever want to work with. It wasn't like the mental health center where they dribble in. They were all in one place and I had access to all of them, you know, so I could ask them all the questions I wanted to. So when I got a piece of information like that, I would start asking the other ones, hey, when you ignore the, the voices, what happens? Consistently, you know, one to one correlation. They got louder. They won't be ignored. You know, so these patterns started emerging. You know, so I. Uh, I'd, I'd keep track of them. That that was the next uh, kind of fabrication I ran into. And then I would watch what the psychiatrists were doing. So here they say these things are a biochemical imbalance. They started off with blaming mothers. Okay, you know, back in the 50s, I think. Oh, the mothers, that they, they treated the kid bad or they beat him or they, they, they blamed it on mothers. But you could, you could see that. And the mothers stood up and go, hey, I didn't do anything. I didn't make my kid psychotic. What, what are you talking about? So there was a lot of resistance because the general population could see for themselves what was going on. So they moved it up into genetics. You know, oh, there's a bad gene. It's the, it's the, it's the genes that cause schizophrenia. They had no, they had no uh, proof of that, you know, but people couldn't see it. So they moved it from, from what an entire population and psychiatrists, psychologists, everybody else could look at to an area that was very circumscribed and very small. And that was the area of, of the biogeneticists, you know, and not even a lot of them wanted to look into schizophrenia or anything like that. They were interested in other things. So they got away with that for a decade or more. Oh yeah, it's a it's a genetic disorder, you know. And they're publishing all this stuff. Meanwhile, they're they're selling their drugs by the billions of dollars worth, until some geneticists that were interested in it started publishing. No, we can't find any schizophrenic gene. And then they went nuts. 
well, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? You know, tried to fund all these other things saying, oh yeah, there's uh, some, some genetic thing. So they didn't find anything. So they, they killed that. So they had to have something else. So something that people couldn't look at, you know, couldn't see for themselves. So they moved it up into the, the um, biochemical area. It's a biochemical disorder in the brain. Yeah. That was made up by Eli Lilly, I think, in the 70s when they came mm -hmm. out with Prozac. Complete fabrication. They knew it was a lie at the time. They published it and they, they, they pushed it anyway. You know, put it on all their advertisements and they're still doing that today. You look at drug advertisements for schizophrenia. It is believed that it's a biochemical imbalance of the brain. You know, but, you know I was watching what the psychiatrist did. You know, and I've worked around a, a bunch of them. Not a single one of them gave any kind of test before they started prescribing these medications. So I'm thinking, like, what's the baseline? You know, what, what's out of balance? What's by how much? You know, there's like uh, what 23 different neurotransmitters in the brain. Which one of them are out of balance? How, by how much are they out of balance? How do they know this? You know. So I asked one of them. He, he went, "Oh well, uh, we just we just rely on the pharmaceutical industry to kind of." provide that and they just say you know use these kind of medicines for bipolar and use these for schizophrenia and da, 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 da. that balances out some mysterious something that they never talk about the truth of it is they don't have any test to check for an imbalance in the brain they have no idea what the chemical balance of the brain should even be but yet with their propaganda that they're putting out year after year and putting billions of dollars behind, they have the entire globe brainwashed into thinking that there's a chemical imbalance. You know? So that was disproven. And boy, they didn't like that. So then uh, they started doing autopsies on some of these schizophrenics that had been taking these drugs for a long period of time. And uh, they were finding, finding that their brains were shrunk like walnuts. Yeah. Wow. And uh, what they kind didn't of like drugs that. Are they on Jerry? Sorry. What kind of well, drugs are they in, in my day, well, they call them they, they call them phenothiazines. Hmm. You know, so what they were so they, the, they were phenothiazines was the first class of antipsychotic drug. And the dr drug companies are saying, yeah, we have to charge so much for these because we put years and years of research in and it costs a horrendous amount of money to get our our uh, our investment back. Phenothiazines were discovered by accident in a French drug lab and a French dye lab. And the, the dye workers were getting all gorked out. And then they, <laughs> they, they took those dyes and they broke them down. And they saw that, if, you know, people who took these drugs were tranquilized. You know, they were gorked out. So they wanted to try that in Europe. But the uh, Freudians had control of the system over there. And they weren't getting very far. And their, their uh, therapies were very expensive. Not didn't help a lot of people. So they came over to the U.S. and they got permission to use them with a uh, state hospital, I think, somewhere out west. And and they, they drugged the entire population. They weren't causing any problems. They were all gorked out. You know, one of the, fir one of the first of those drugs was uh, Thorazine. It's a very rough drug. Lots of side effects. You know, but they were able to drug down entire psychiatric populations, which allowed them to reduce the amount of staff they had. And it also reduced the amount of staff injuries because these guys, before those drugs, they had to wrestle these guys into straitjackets. You know, and they, you know, staff were getting black eyes and bloody noses and people were getting arms broken. And, and you know, it, they had the, it was actually a wrestling match. And those psychotics, when they get, when they go off, they get very strong. They get supernaturally strong. So we had that going on. Uh, so that, that fostered more distrust on my part. You know, what are they talking about? So nobody knew what the voices were saying. And, and I could see that there was a correlation between the patient listening to the voices and their acting out. And uh, I didn't know what the voices were. Um, so I started asking these guys. And it took about a year and a half to two years to get to find out how to talk to them because they were so gun shy of psych staff because every time they start talking about their voices, the psychiatrists would drug them more. So they would just drug them down until they were friggin' virtual zombies. I mean, just shuffle around in a daze. Uh, so they learned not to tell the psychiatrist a whole lot about the voices. You know, they, they may have needed the drugs to some degree, but they didn't want to be drugged, you know, senseless. 
And uh, so it took a while to, to get them to talk about them. And one of the first patterns I saw was that the voices were consistently negative. You know, they they were they never said anything positive. It was always you're no good. You're you're rotten. You're ugly. You're stupid. Uh, nobody likes you. Your, your parents are only faking like they like you. Uh, every rotten thing that you can imagine mm -hmm. is what these things were telling these people. Yeah. You know? Why would hallucination do that? Why would it stay negative? Why why wasn't it random like all other hallucinations that are all over the place? You know, some are good, some are neutral, some are in between. They're just all over the place. These things were consistently negative. You know, what held them on a negative trajectory? You know, why why didn't they go random? Something was holding them in place that they were only negative. If they said anything positive, it was usually just to come out from behind the guy and stab him in the back later. Yeah. Um, so that was the first thing that I saw was is when they started running patterns. And I'm like, why isn't this random? Why, why isn't, if it's a real hallucination, why isn't it all over the place? The second one I saw was Patients started coming to me and, and saying uh, the voices went nuts when they went to church. They didn't like church. They didn't like the preachers. Um, they would have uh, ice cream socials sometime in the rehab center where I was working. And the only people who stayed on the dingy wards were the schizophrenics who were hearing voices. Wow. Um, and I, I noticed that at first. And then I started asking them questions about it. Why aren't you down there with the rest of the guys, you know, dancing, listening to music, uh, um, eating ice cream and cake? Because uh, ice cream and cake was hard to come by at the state hospital. And uh, they stayed up on the dingy ward. And, and while I was talking to those guys who stayed behind, I noticed that on their book stands, there were all these negative books, war stories, murder mysteries, uh, uh, horror stories. I mean, just all negative stuff. And it was only with the schizophrenics. You know, so I'm like, what's going on there? You know, so that was another pattern that I saw emerging. And uh, as I started talking to these guys, they go, uh, well, I don't believe in God. I don't like preachers. Uh, it's a bunch of bull crap. I asked God for help a lot of times. He never came. He never helped me. Uh, you know, the Bible is just to placate people. Uh, you know, they were completely negative with regard to religion. And then an uh, interesting thing happened as one guy came to me and said, when I repeat the 23rd Psalm, the voices react like worms thrown on a hot frying pan. Wow. You know, so I've said, that's interesting. You know, so I started asking other patients what happens when they went to church? What happened when they read the Bible? And what happened when they tried to pray? What happened when they tried to read the 23rd Psalm? And, and it it, they, the voices were completely anti-religious. So there were three classes of, of schizophrenic people who went to church. The ones whose voices were weak, when they went to church, the voices shut up. The ones who were intermediate, where the intermediate strength, they would get, they would just babble incessantly. So the patient couldn't hear what the preacher was saying. The ones where the voices were very strong, they would actually drive them out of the church. They would get up and run out of the church because they couldn't stand the intensity. So th those three categories seemed to uh, uh, persist. You know, they didn't go anywhere. Um, and this negative anti-religious stuff was um, consistent. So why would a hallucination be anti-religious? You know, why why would it it say stuff like I remember. Uh, several times the patients were told Jesus Christ couldn't even save himself. So what makes you think he's going to save you? you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of the patients felt, well, there's something in the Bible that could help me. So they tried to, they tried to read the Bible and the voices would come back and say, okay, if you're going to read the Bible, you got to read it from cover to cover. And the patient would agree. So they'd start reading it cover to cover, start at the very beginning, and then they'd hit the part where this guy begat that guy, begat that guy, and it goes on for like a million pages of who begot who. Voices would show back up and go, you know, what are you reading this garbage for? You know, what are you getting out of this who begot who? What do you care? You know, th this is a bunch of garbage. This is proof. And, and then they would try to get them to stop reading it at that point. And it worked. You know, in a lot of cases, it worked. So... The, the, the voices were completely any religious. 
Why would a hallucination be any religious? Now, all these things I'm telling you guys right now, these are all traits of these entities. So these entities are energetic. They're like a magnetic field. I mean, your soul is energetic, your thoughts are energetic, your memory is energetic. Uh, we're, we're energetic beings. Mm -hmm. I mean, these things are energetic, so they have an energetic effect on all of us, not just the schizophrenics. I mean, they, they get them the worst. But if you look at a magnet, you can't see the magnetic field. It's there. You can't see it. You can't smell it. You can't taste it. It's undetectable to us. It's a form of energy. Just as these things are a form of energy. The only way you can tell a form of energy, like gravity, you can't see it. You can't smell it. You, can, you If you drop something, you can see the effect that that energy has on uh, physical beings. Same thing with these these voices. These are the effects they have. So you, you get a, a bottle of iron filings and you put it on top of that magnet. Now you can see the outline of a magnetic field. That's what these patterns are. These are the magnetic outline of these schizophrenic voices. This is their, this is their energetic signature. This is something that everybody can see. You know, you don't have to have a, a genetics degree. You don't have to have a, be a biochemist. Anybody who works with schizophrenics can see this. You know, and these are going to be the same patterns that the, the these voices that you guys deal with, these negative entities run. You know, that it's going to be the same patterns. Okay, they they foster and they create negative emotion. They feed off of that negative emotion. So one one of the other patterns I I saw was that when these, these schizophrenics are attacked by these voices, after the attack, they're energetically drained. You know, they can't even get up for breakfast. Um, and I started asking them that too. I said, after the voices come, do you feel, uh, I mean, how do you feel? They, they all reported they were drained. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the voices attacking them and them being energetically drained. And if the voices are there all the time, they're energetically drained all the time. They don't have any energy. Now, for years, I mean, probably 15, 20 years, I thought this was because of how rotten the voices are. I mean, if you had voices in your head screaming at you saying, you're no good, you're rotten, you're stupid, you're ugly, nobody likes, and as it goes on and on and on forever, I mean, you think that would wear you down. But uh, there was one day when I was working at the prison, uh, in the psychology department of the prison, I was put over not only a psych unit, but I also had responsibility for the jail for the prison. So this is where the worst of the worst of the prisoners went from all around the whole prison complex. The worst of the worst would end up in this jail. So uh, I was responsible for keeping that jail psychiatrically under control. Um, so I'd, I'd refer people to the psychiatrist. <clears throat> and then one day I walk into my office and here's this inmate letter from one of the inmates in the, in a cell over there. These were small cells. They were probably eight by 10 cells, you know, small enough for a bunk bed, uh, a toilet, a sink, and and a desk, a small desk. That was it. You know, even if I'd, I'm not even sure they had a desk in there. They only got one hour out in the in the sunlight every day. The rest of the time they're cooped up in this little cell. And this one one inmate in one of these cells over there wrote me a, a letter and said, my, my, my cellmate is crazy. He's crazy as a bed bug. He's pacing around. He's talking to somebody I can't see. He's arguing with somebody I can't see. He stays up all the time. He doesn't sleep. And he's, he stands over me at three o'clock in the morning. I wake up and he's standing there staring at me. Mm -hmm. You know, and this, so the guy's floridly psychotic. And this guy's sealed in the cell with him. So I look up, I look up this guy who wrote me that that inmate letter, and looked at his mental health history and why he was sent over there. So he didn't have much of a mental health history, but he did snitch off the Aryan Blood Brotherhood, which was a, a violent prison gang, you know, in the prison. He snitched off one of their drug deals, and they lost all their drugs. And they were broken up and they were scattered all over the state. So they wanted him dead. They had already stabbed him once and he was in there for protective custody. So they wanted him dead so bad that a couple of them got in enough trouble to get thrown into that that jail where he was hoping for an attempt to, to be able to kill him. So they were in the same cells that surrounded him. 
And they were throwing notes under his door saying, we're here. We're waiting for you. First chance we get, you're a dead man. You know, the first chance we can get you, we're, you're, we're right here. And they're throwing all these notes under his door. So he's locked in there with this crazy guy. So I thought, uh, uh, I, I, first I went and I uh, brought out the guy who wasn't crazy. Brought him up to the interview room by the control tower and watched him as he came up the steps from the cell block. And he had plenty of energy. He didn't have to use the, the handrails. He, you know, went up the steps. His gait was normal. He was anxious. He, he, had, he sat down. He was alert. He wasn't, you know, his, he made sense. He was coherent. He wasn't slumped down in the chair. He was plenty anxious, you know, but he, he wasn't energetically drained. Mm. Yeah. And I watched him go back. It was the same thing. So when I brought up his cellmate, the crazy guy, he had to hold, hold on to the uh, handrail. He, he was slow getting up the steps. He kind of shuffled into the uh, interview room. He sat in the chair and he was like energetically drained. And I asked him, you hearing, you hearing voices? He said, yeah, I, I hear him. I hear him all the time. They're constant. Yeah. And, uh, said, you don't have any energy, do you? He said, no, I never have any energy. So here, the, you couldn't have a better experimental situation. They're in the same cell with the same people eating the same food under the same physical conditions. You know, everything else is neutralized. You know, the crazy guy's got no energy. The 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 other guy who you couldn't get under much more stress than that. Here's the the gangsters trying to kill him from the outside and he's locked in in a small cell with a completely psychotic guy who's who's virtually out of control you know it doesn't get more stressful than that unless you're in a war so after and when i left that that uh that interview i went it's not it, it's not the anxiety something else is going on so i was reading a book by M M miguel ruiz and he talked about an energy drain that these things were energetically draining these people. So I started asking them, you know, one after another, scores of them, how do you feel before the voices come? How do you feel after the voices come? And I came up with a, a you know, a subjective measurement, one to 10 scale. You know, how do you feel before the voices come? How do you feel after the voices come? And consistently, they had much more energy before the voices attacked them than after they were attacked. And I had scores of these these written records and i think we actually did an analysis of variance on them and and it came out statistically significant you know so before the attack they have energy after the attack they're drained so I, i'm going they must be energetic parasites mm -hmm. yeah. so i started asking them you know hundreds of them yeah yeah when the voices after the voices attack i'm drained yeah so they're feeding off of these people and it makes all these all this crap that they're putting into their heads is all to create negative emotion, which they can't produce themselves. So so all those voices, you're no good, you're ugly, you're stupid, the, 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 what what psychiatry calls hallucinations huh, are are designed to make these people lower their vibration. To the to the vibrational level of these entities, and then these entities can feed off them, but not before. We're the food and the fuel for these things. Yeah, they're the yes, fuel. They are. And they don't just hit them; they hit us all. You know, you're walking around one day and this horrible thought comes bolting through your head, and you're going, well, "That where did that come from? That's not me. I, I I'm not going to do that." You know, it's it's like everybody's experienced that. That's these things. They they hit us all. You know, and the lower your vibrational level, the higher they hit you, the more they hit you, you know, so they foster and they create negative emotion. So if, if you look through these things as, as we're going, this is the energetic signature of these things. This is the magnetic uh, uh, iron filings for this is the energetic signature of these things. So they energetically drain their victims. They get louder after sunset consistently. They get louder when ignored. They will not be ignored. They foster self-destructive behavior. They foster isolation. And that's the worst thing these, these guys can do. You know, the voices get them to isolate. They don't want to deal with their parents. They don't want to deal with friends. They don't want to deal with them. They want to lock themselves in their room and they just want to sit there with the voices. And the voices want that. They don't want any interference with, with anybody trying to help this guy. They just want to suck his energy. 
you know, and you, you talk to mothers and fathers who have schizophrenic kids and they say, we can't get him out of his room. That's all he does. He just sits there all day and he, he, uh, he's talking to somebody in there. So they foster isolation. They demand the attention of their victims. They will not be ignored. You can't ignore them. They get louder if you ignore them. They maneuver for an e increased control over their victims. So if something isn't done to interfere with them, they will slowly but surely start taking more and more control. And usually they don't have complete control, but they have different varying amounts of control. The person is always fighting for you know, their, their own integrity, but the voices are inching and chipping away at it. They gaslight the person. So uh, there was one 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 guy that uh, he he was he was pretty psychotic and he 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 was having trouble telling the difference between reality and what the voices were telling him. So the voices told him he had murdered somebody. He didn't know whether he had or not. Wow. You know he didn't trust his own his own judgment that far. So he, they had him in a catch twenty two. If he if he went and told the police that he murdered somebody, he was going to end up in prison or he's going to get locked up for being crazy. If he didn't say anything to anybody, every time the police showed up anywhere, if they were, you know, just walking or driving, every time he encountered the police, th there would be a reaction. You know, they're looking for me. They're searching for me. They're they're going to get me. I better hide. Yeah. So it was it, it was they were gaslighting him. There was no escape. They had him in a catch twenty two. They manipulate perception in the worst possible way. So if if the schizophrenic's walking along a sidewalk and some guy tells a joke to some other guys off, you know, down the block, they all start laughing. The voices tell them they're laughing at you. You know, they're making fun of you. You know, again, uh, a gaslight to keep them down and in that negative emotional area that they can feed off of. Now, this is real interesting. They have complete access to the schizophrenic's memory. They can go in there and they can bring up every rotten thing he had ever done and stuff that he had done two decades before that he'd long forgotten about. They can, they, because they're energetic, memories are energetic. You know, your, your mind is energetic. Your soul is energetic. So what we're dealing with is energy. We're not dealing with a physical phenomena here. The energy impacts the, the body, you know, and it's the body that feels things. So after death, there is no feeling. You know, you, you, you look at these um, life after life people that come back. They're looking at their body with complete, uh, you know, it's like, well, so what? You know, I'm here. I feel good. You know, there's no emotion attached to anything they're viewing after they're out of their body. So it's the body that does the feeling stuff. And it's these energies that impact the body. Yeah. So. <clears throat> They, like I said, they can go in there, they can pull up every rotten thing the guy had ever done, even these most minuscule things. Uh, one guy borrowed a dime from somebody 10 years ago. He forgot to pay it back and the voices are ragging him for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the worst I've seen was, uh, and I've seen this twice, both with females where either an uncle or a father had sexually molested them horribly and uh, the voices were ragging them about it all the time. Then that person died. And they went to the funeral and they were going, thank God he's dead. You know, just thank God he's out of my life. He's dead. And the voices would come in and mimic the voice of the, of the father or the uncle and go, you remember when I did this? You remember when I did that? You know, so they, they, they got the, the victim to believe that now that the, body, the guy's body was dead, he was now haunting them from the afterlife. And that was horrendous to them. You know, that they they just drained their energy forever. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it was really bad. They don't want the victim to tell anybody else about their presence. You know, they don't want them telling their mom, their dad, their friends, anybody. They want to stay anonymous. They don't want to be discovered. You know, um, you know what's interesting is shock treatments would would drive them away for a short period of time. You know, the, so the shock treatments they gave in the, in the psych hospitals, yeah. it, it would get rid of them for a period of time, you know, but in most cases, they would eventually come back. In some cases, it was enough of, of, of a, a, a time away for the person to kind of get a foothold on, on reality again. They're consummate liars. They lie about everything. You can't believe anything they say. They, you can't, they, they will keep no bargains, you know. Now, as we're going through these, 
look at what the, the mainstream media is doing to us right now. They're, this is the exact rundown that they're doing to us over the mainstream media. Consummate lying to us, you know, the uh, uh, manipulations, the you know, all this stuff, it just matches it. Anti-religious, negativity, foster and create negative emotion, drain their victims. You know, the television, they're, they're just constantly blaring at you. Uh, they won't be ignored. It's come, they come at you from everywhere. You know, they foster isolation. You know, the, especially during this the uh, virus thing, you know, uh, they gaslight. I mean, it, it's all the same. It's the same entities on a macroscopic scale. Yeah, I think you're right. So, the, you know, they don't want to be discovered, you know, just like the voices. They want to stay in the background and act without anybody seeing them. Um, they're consummate liars. You can't you can't make any bargains with them. You can't make any deals with them. They won't keep any deals. You know, they they get just as much energy from getting the person to believe a lie as they do telling them a truth, mm. you know, and, the, you know, any truth that they tell them is usually to manipulate them and get them to trust. And then they they get them later. You know, so it, it's all a mechanism to to get more control over them. They they constantly steer their victim away from anything that might foster or create joy. They don't want the person to be happy. They don't want them watching uh comedy they don't want him feeling good you know and anybody who's laughing or joking they're like oh he's a goofball you know mm -hmm. uh, they can manipulate feeling without uh without speaking so a lot of times the schizophrenic is just sitting there and then all of a sudden he starts feeling bad and nothing has actually happened to make him feel that way you know? they should they can short circuit reason they can get him to believe the most ridiculous stuff um you know Boredom is bad. I mean, if they get bored, these things move right in. Uh, the, now, this is this is really deceptive of them. They insert their thoughts into the the patient's thought stream. Okay, so there's no difference between how they sound and all the thousands and thousands of thoughts that the patient has coming through their head on it on any one day. And I remember one time uh, when I was working at the state hospital, I'm like, what are these things? What are these? And I prayed to be able to hear them, you know, and they tried to kill me and they picked on the wrong guy. They should have they should have got me in some other situation. They they got me while I was swimming and were trying to convince me that I was going to drown. You know, by then I was I was a consummate swimmer. I was like a fish in the water. I was a double certified scuba diver, you know, with a year's worth of training in, in Temple University. They weren't going to get me to panic in the water. Yeah. Did they do but, that, Jerry, through voices in your head? Or Yeah, yeah what they were telling me, I, I can tell you the story if you want to hear it. it it's, yeah. you, you want me to go there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um. 10 to 11. I'd like to keep this below two hours if we can. Okay. What happened is I, I prayed, I, you know, Lord, let me hear these things. I, I, I don't know what they are. Um, you know, so it was about two to three weeks later, I, I, after working at the, the, the state hospital all day with all these crazy guys, I'd just come back and I lived on a lake and I would just go out and swim, but I would set out around sunset because the motorboats were, were less, you know, so I was a good swimmer. And I, I got into like a hypnotic trance and, and I would just balance my air intake with how much energy I was putting out. I just cut through the water. This particular day, it was just like glass. There was no waves. There was no anything. I was, I was just going. And uh, I don't know how long I'd been going, but I, I started getting tired and I looked up and I was a long way from shore, you know, and, and, the, and the sun was setting and uh, I was tired. And, uh, here, here comes this thought into my head saying, uh, you're a long way from shore. Yeah. Yes. So what? I knew that, you know, uh, the sun's setting, it's getting dark. I, I knew that too. You know, you're too tired to make it back to the shore. Yeah, I was, you know, uh, but I wasn't worried about it because, you know, they taught us to, how to do this kind of dead man's float where you put your hands behind your back, your head is in the water. You're not, you're not breathing and you're just floating like a dead man with your arms hanging. You're not using any energy. You know? So when you need air, you whip your head up, you blow out that air real fast. And as soon as you do that, you start sinking. 
Okay? And then before your head goes underwater, you have to take in another deep breath. And then you just bob underwater, you sink for a couple of feet, and then you bob back up like a dead guy, and you're just floating like a dead man again. So it takes very little energy. You could do that for days if you didn't freeze to death in the water. But that night, the water was like bath water. It was very warm. So here's this thing telling me all these things I already know. But after it tells me I'm too tired to make it back to the shore, here comes this thought like, and you're going to drown. And I'm like, I'm going to what? <laughs> what? Where did that? It was the least thing, the last thing on my mind. I wasn't even thinking about it. I wasn't entertaining it at all. It wasn't a, it wasn't a factor to me. I knew what to do. I was perfectly confident in my ability to do it. And but I'm like, where did that come from? You know. So, you know, I, I take another breath, come up, and I'm sink, and I'm dropping down. And this thing goes, you know. It, after that breath, I pop back up, and I'm floating on the surface, and it comes up with this thing again it was like you're too far from shore um you know and it repeats it again the lights are going out you're too tired to make it back to shore uh, and while i was sinking then and it says uh and you're going to drown you're heading for the bottom you're going to drown so all these things were true you know and i'm going that's a yes set that's a psychological yes set it's what salesmen use to sell you know, vacuums and sewing machines you know they, they tell well you know you'd like to have this machine and and you could make these things with it and all these truisms and then they hit you and you want to buy it right so here's this thing trying to get me to buy that i'm going to drown and i i recognized it as a yes set and i'm like why am i running a yes set on myself especially telling myself that i'm going to drown it doesn't make any sense you know so I go up again, and it it says uh, it, it told me I was I was sinking toward the bottom. Yeah, I was sinking toward the bottom. That's what you do when when you do this thing. So the next time, what I do is I I let out more air. Okay, so I started sinking more just to kind of spite it. You know, like so I started started dropping, 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 and I hit what they call a crush step, where your lungs are collapsed by the water pressure so so much that you actually start dropping like a rock. So it's like a slow, slow descent. And then once you hit the crust step, it's like, boom, you start going you know, really fast. And when I felt that, I went, ooh, wait, wait, what's going on? Because I, I was kind of freaked out with what was going on. So I shot for the surface, came up, and here it starts again. You know, now you're panicking. You're too far from shore. You were sinking toward the bottom. The lights are going out. You're going to get disoriented. You're not going to make it back. And you're too tired to make it to the shore. So all these are yes sets. And you're panicking, it's telling me. Mm. And I'm going, what? the blazes is this thing you know so next time i let out more air i, I get past the crush depth and i keep sinking i have equalizing the pressure in my ears as i go down and then i feel this cold something coming up my legs just freezing cold and it's moving up my legs shot to the surface again even before i reached the surface i knew it was the thermocline it's a cold layer of water that sinks below the warm water because it's heavier and it usually sits on the bottom you know so before I even got up, I knew what it was. So I hit the surface and here it goes again. You know, you're panicking. You're too, you're too far from the shore. The lights are going out. You're going to get disoriented. You won't be able to find your way back. You're too tired. It's hitting me with all this stuff again. I'm like, what the hell is this thing? You know, so get, catch my breath and I go down again. So hit the crush step, come shooting for the bottom. I feel the thermocline. It's coming up. It covers my whole body. But what was so strange about it were the thermoclines I'd been used to sit on the bottom. This one wasn't sitting on the bottom. I guess it was still in the process of sinking. So I go through the thermocline and then I hit I hit this something is crawling up my my leg. It is ooky, ooky. It feels like an octopus or something. So I shot to the surface again. Even before I got there, I knew what it was. I had hit the bottom finally. Okay. But I thought the bottom was rock. Because near the shore, it was always rock. So as far as I could ever feel it, it was rock. No, this was oozed. You know? So I hit the top again. Mm -hmm. And this time, you know, it, starts, it starts its crap again. You're panicking. You're, you're too tired to make it back to the shore. And a motorboat is coming toward you. Now, you can hear the sound of a motorboat underwater for a long way. I didn't hear any water, motorboat while I was under. And I look off in the distance and sure as shooting, here's this motorboat coming toward me. You know, it's still a good ways away, but I wasn't going to go under again until it passed. And here's this thing saying, it can't see you. 
which was true. It's, it's coming right at you, which was true. It's going to cut you to ribbons. You're, you're going to be ground mincemeat by the time it runs over you. You know, it's going to yes. knock you out. And I'm like, you know, I've had to dive under motorboats while I was scuba diving a number of times. <laughs> I can deal with it. You know, if I need to, I'll dive under it and I'll stay down there until it passes over. I'm not worried about it. You know, it's uh, I, I, it's not something I want to do, but I can I can do it if I if I need to. So I'm, I'm watching this motorboat come and it's it's going right toward me. And this thing saying it's going to hit you. It's going to hit you. It's going to hit you. And I'm like, shut up. You know? And it goes right past maybe 30 feet in front of me and they didn't see me you know it was dark and i'm watching it pass in the distance and this the, the wave from from the bow wave you know i'm not paying any attention to it i'm taking a breath of air in as this thing just rolls over my head and i take in a mouthful of water and i start choking on the water and i spit it out i cleared my throat and, and now now it's going nuts you know, it's like, oh, now you're now you're drowning. You're choking. You're 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 you're, you're heading for. You're going to sink. You can't make it back to shore. You're going to drown. And I'm like, shut the frick up. You know, what are you? And and I drop to the bottom again. I, I hit this crush depth. Drop through the thermocline. My feet stick in the mud, and it's bath water. And I'm floating on the bottom like I'm dead. You know, and I'm still a little bit afraid because I didn't know what this thing was, and it wasn't me. And, you know, so I'm aware I'm waiting for something to, and it's pitch black down there. By, by now, it's like 10 o'clock at night. So I'm sitting at the bottom at 10 o'clock at night, maybe 35 feet down, like a dead man with my feet stuck in the bottom, waiting for something to grab me. And what it was, was everything was shut off. There was no feeling. There was no thought because I was I was I was paying attention to whatever was coming. You know, I was like there was no thought. My feeling was shut off. My feet were stuck in the mud. I wasn't breathing. It was just pure consciousness. It was like I was aware that I was aware. And that's all there was. Past you get out of your body, that's all there is. It's the, the awareness you're, of your spirit. And that was like a, what do you call it? That was like a, a sentinel moment for me to realize that that's who I was past everything being gone, the body. So it was it was one devil of a lesson. You know, I came back, I, I swam to the shore and, and uh, that was my en encounter with with one of the voices. But it sounded just like my own thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know, there wasn't any, you're going to drown or anything like that. It wasn't, <laughs> you know, nothing like that. It was like no creepy uh, voices, no creepy voice. It sounded just mm -hmm. like the th thousands and ten thousands of other thoughts that uh, come through my mind on a regular day. Only the intent was very different. Yeah. So that's one of the things schizophrenics have to understand you know it's the intent it it's any any negative voice about yourself comes from them you know any negative thought about somebody else comes from them you know and the intent of that thought you need to pay attention to that you know because it's not your thought swedenborg brought that up 300 years ago you know that these things they come in through your memory and through your aff affection or your affect and then they move into your thought you know, so when they're when they're at a low energetic level, they're thinking low, they're feeling low, and that it kind of opens the doors for these things. You know, so I'm kind of wondering, you know, even if you do drive them out, if that person doesn't get on a positive spiritual path and start increasing their their vibration, I can't see where they won't come back. Yeah. You know, even if you do get rid of them, and and in order to to really get rid of them permanently. You got to remove like like Mace does. You got to remove those negative identities, those programs that were put in their brains and into their memory during traumas, because during trauma, all your energy is turned on you, you know. Yes. And and any decision you make during a trauma, like how did I get here? What did I what did I do to deserve this? I mean, it's it's all focused on you. So you, you'll make a decision about yourself, and it's always a negative decision because if you're in a negative state, you're not going to make a positive decision. You know, it's going to be a negative decision. That negative decision and that negative uh, uh, emotion are taken by the ego and they're buried, but they're buried alive. So it's like a, a negative computer program or a, a, a virus, a, a mental virus, that the energy is funneled through that virus and it, it clouds the person's entire life. So if you don't get rid of these things, 
these things are going to keep getting triggered. They're like uh, they're like landmines. So you have a, a bad experience with somebody, and it's it's everybody has a person that that they hate. It's like you know, and that no matter where you go, that person shows up. That's a negative identity that's being triggered based on a trauma you had with a similar person could have been decades ago, you know? And yeah. so anytime somebody like that approaches your field, you know, that, that negative identity, which is being held in, it takes energy to hold that in is reacting. Usually it's a fight or flight response. You know, when somebody like that, somebody you hate comes up, it's either you're either going to fight with them or you're going to run from them, but it always disturbs the person. It always disturbs their inner peace. So that's why those have to be removed also, you know, but in a lot of cases, I can't get past the negative entity that you guys remove to get to those, you know, because they, they jump in there. Don't listen to this guy. They start screaming at the person. They ruin his concentration. They, they you know, they, they, they don't allow him to concentrate well enough for me mm -hmm. to use the mace method with them. You know, if you guys remove them first and then I get them, then I can do something. Or if, if, if they're put on medications, then you can reach them. This happens before sessions too, when uh, you have a client that has even a heavy entity attachment, but they have some entities, they will often try to derail them from coming to their session. Oh yeah. They, they did don't that want with them to me come all the time. see us. Yeah. Yep. Oh, don't go there. That, that's stupid. You don't want to, yeah. that happened to me in the prison all the time. And the prisoners yeah. would tell me about it. You know, so I had a group of prisoners that I had a deal with that you know, whatever happened in the, in our session, they would tell me in real time what the voices were telling, you know, in turn, I would help them out as much as I could with whatever I could help them out with. So that worked out pretty well, except when they come in and they go, that guard dishonored me. He, he embarrassed me in front of my friends, you know, and the voices are telling me to stick a knife in his gut, you know, mm. so it got a little hairy then. So wow. I had to watch him a little closer. Because if, you know, if he did something like that, and the administration found out that I, he had told me that he was thinking about that, you know, they would have locked him down immediately. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if I did squeal on him and he didn't do anything, that would be it. None of the rest of them would ever trust me again. Yeah. Right. So I had to be very careful with that. You know, the, the voices cause selective forgetting. You know, they forget to come to their appointments. They'll forget to do the homework you give them. Um, they fill the victim mind with negative thoughts about themselves and everybody else. Uh, they destroy they destroy any positive self-concept. They attempt to pull their victim away from consensual reality. They want them to believe what they're telling them, you know, that these people are laughing at you, that that car appeared in front of you because the driver had some malicious intent, you know, that this bird uh, uh, was some signal from the devil or from God or something, you know, whatever. And they use confusion as a means of instilling these negative suggestions, just like hypnotists do. You know, you get get the person confused and they they, they don't like that confused feeling. You give them uh, something to concentrate on or a direction to go in and they'll follow that. Well, these things do the same thing, only it's usually for a negative manner. Uh, they're averse to anything positive or beautiful. They don't like the person going out in nature. They don't like him walking in the woods. They don't like him going to the seashore. They don't like him going anywhere nice or beautiful. Um, that's it. That's it. So those are the patterns we've identified so far. Mm -hmm. And this is this is their this is their energetic footprint. Anybody working from with schizophrenia can see this for themselves. And if they're running patterns, they can't be hallucinations like the psychiatric mafia is insisting. And those drugs that they give these people don't cure anything. You know, yes. they, they, they dump them, they damp them down, they tranquilize them, but they don't cure anything. They don't get rid of the voices. They don't cure schizophrenia. Right. They don't cure depression. They don't cure anxiety. They don't cure anything. And they're making billions of dollars a year uh, selling these things. Hey, you Jerry, know? once, once oh, we're talking, ahead. once we're talking about uh, drugs here, Alice had a question in the chat. Do you have any experience in successful herbal treatments for patients with those symptoms? Which symptoms? Psych or schizophrenia. Vo yeah. Voice voices. Yeah. Oh yeah. A handful. Okay. You know, and a number of others got significantly better. What which uh, herbal treatments did you have? Oh, herbal treatment. No, I herbal. thought you. I thought you meant verbal. Verbal no. treatments. <laughs> no, not not Her herbal. Not, 
Uh, I'll tell you what, they don't like sage. Hmm. They don't like the smell of sage. I don't, I don't know why that is. They don't like, um, um, what is that? Uh, the, the, the three wise men had that, uh, frankincense, incense. frankincense. frankincense. They don't like frankincense. How about myrrh? How about I, myrrh? I haven't heard anything about myrrh. Um, you know, it's interesting because these guys come to me and they tell me, um, you know, they tell me what, what works for them and what doesn't, they don't want them in sunlight. They don't want them out in the sunlight. Uh, they hate the 23rd Psalm. They can't stand it. Mm -hmm. um, they hate the Gregorian chants. They don't like. See, so what I started out doing, you know, I didn't know anything about spiritual releasement or anything like that. I started hitting them with what they didn't like. So if they complained to a patient uh, about what they didn't like, I would tell them to give them more of the same. Mm -hmm. you know? And what happened when you did that? Well, they got more agitated. And, and they didn't like it. So what would happen was that they're using up the energy instead of the patient using up his energy, they're using up their energy, okay? And they get more agitated and the patient feels like he has some control, mm. you know? Um, that, that's, one thing, that's one thing with them. They, they don't feel like they have any control. You know, and and you give them something that they can they can get a reaction to from the voices, and that gives them some sense of control. Yeah. Um, I would love to hear about the. Did you call it the pace mace method, and how you deal with entities? Are you able to help them remove them, or what has been your experience? Well, I'm, I'm not as experienced at doing that as you guys. I can, I can deal with the, you know, the little guys like the, uh, uh, the dead people who are stuck here, Earthbound um, spirits. those kind of guys. But the, these big guys like the exorcist stuff, that's out of my league. Yeah, I refer <laughs> them to Tony. I don't, I don't know how many of them showed up that I referred to you, Tony. Did any of I, them show up? I think two so far. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, one of the ladies was, you know, that she just started hearing voicing in her in, in her head, and and she was just actually, th you know, thrown into an institute um, because of it and drugged up, and she's oh, it was really goodness. messed her up. But yeah, yes, so so I, once you once I, you get I, go ahead. <laughs> once you get rid of the big guys there, send it back to me, and I'll do the May stuff and clear the rest <laughs> yeah, out. They, you get you the go. rest of them. Because <laughs> I, I, I was just going to say, I, I love talking to them. I, I absolutely love that. That's my favorite part is the entity Tony's release. Jam. And talking. Well, I, I saw you work. <laughs> You're very smooth. <laughs> because yeah. they, make, they make me laugh to some of the stuff they, that they say. And I'm like, man, this is interesting because I never go into a session, you know, with any goal or anything because whatever comes up and some crazy stuff comes up and you just mm -hmm. never even... You, Every day is every session. Yeah, different. it's never boring. <laughs> no. no. You know. So, Heather, you were asking about mace. Yeah. Okay. Mace, it's very interesting. I, in my entire life, I was searching for something that worked. You know, I went all through undergraduate school looking for something that worked, something that was useful. Nothing was there. And you know, went through the master's degree. You know, the counseling, uh, you know, there was some stuff, you know, reflection and the, you know, the, it, it allowed you to, Get the person to respond because you were you're paying attention to them. Different ways to talk. And that it it was it was somewhat useful. The PhD was totally useless. I mean, it was worse than any of the others. You know, no answer. So I, I was there was not any, any answer. I, I kept thinking they they're hiding the answer. So when I finished undergraduate, I'm going well. They're they're hiding the answers in the master's program. Maybe they only tell it to the master's guys. You know, so so went got the master's. So now now there wasn't any real answers there. There was nothing that was curing people in any of those. So I'm going, they're hiding it in the PhD program. So I got into one of the best PhD programs in the country. And it, it was a disaster. I mean, it was two years of that and, and nothing. I mean, I was getting more and more depressed. They had no answers. They were using the, the DSM as their Bible. Uh, a lot of the stuff they were teaching me didn't, didn't mesh with what I'd seen on the front lines. Uh, most of those professors didn't have any frontline experience at all, except maybe high school counseling or something like that they they weren't on the front lines they they didn't know what it was like and here are here it's you know this massive amount of information and then they take turns picking on the students 
you know, and it was, I didn't cotton to that real well either for, for no reason. It's like, how much crap can you take? You know? So when I ran into to Mace, it was about two years ago. And, uh, I, I'm, I get, get all these emails from all these people. Some of them are pretty strange. This guy wrote me and he says, I got somebody you got to meet. So he wasn't asking me for anything uh, himself. He's going, uh, she's she's at, at the very worst she'd be a jolly old lady i think you'll enjoy talking to her and i found that interesting you know um and let me say i think even before that i'd read both the mace books i'd, I'd heard of them before john mace wrote two books uh and i read them and i was using them and it was working you know it, i it, I, I was savvy enough to put what he had said in those two books together and, and make it work. It turned out that the old lady that he wanted me to meet was the chief trainer, the chief training officer for the Mace Institute in Australia. Oh, wow. And I didn't know who she was. <laughs> and I, I got talking to her. She was a hoot. You know, we had all these similar experiences. And, uh, you know, she's going, well, why don't you why don't you take the training? And I said, why should I do that? It's working for me now, you know, and uh, but, you know, she she finally convinced me I, I signed up and two years later, I mean, it, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper, you know, into the energetic treatment of the. the actually, it's it's the spirit. So it's the only it's the only psychotherapy that I've seen that takes the spirit into account. You know, and that's a vital part of it. So. What Mace found was that the mind is not what psychology and psychiatry teach you the mind are. He says the mind is basically a stimulus response mechanism that takes pictures of where you put your, your attention. And that's mm -hmm. all it does. It's like, a, it's like a computer screen. The body is like the keyboard. You know, the CPU is like the, the spirit or the, uh, the um, ent entity or the spirit. And the monitor is the feedback. So between the CPU and the monitor is your interaction with the physical world. Okay, it gives you feedback about where you are, what you're doing. You know, if we didn't have the monitor right now, you write a letter and, and then you got no feedback. You can't remember what you said, you know? So he said the mind doesn't rationalize. It doesn't, um, it doesn't do any mental processing. It's just a stimulus response mechanism that takes, it makes what the spirit has formulated into a thought or a concept or a feeling, and it makes it into a picture. Okay. That picture is energetic. The soul is energetic. These ideas are energetic. So we're working in what Mace calls the energy universe. There is no time. There is no space. There is no matter there. And that's where your soul is. There's no time, space, or matter there. So it's a it's a non-physical being trapped in a physical body, but it's still a non-physical being. So your thoughts are energetic. Your memory is energetic. Your vision is energetic. I mean, you're, we're energetic beings. Mm -hmm. So what happens is these energetic flow gets disturbed in a trauma. So what Mace found was that that the mind can not only turn where you put your attention into a image, it can turn a concept, it can turn a feeling, it can turn a physical thing into a picture. And that picture is energy. Energy, he said, moves, and it does, moves from negative to positive. So your soul is positive. These negative identities are negative. Okay. So once the person forms a image of a, uh, uh, a, 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 a incident in the trauma or, or trauma or uh, uh, a person that they hate, that, that image can be absorbed by the spirit. The conduit is the attention. Okay. So the lady, the gal I was working with uh, last night, she she was badly sexually abused by her father. I mean, she was emotionally destroyed. Um, the person she hated most was her father. So we had the image of her father. I mean, it's the first image that popped into their mind. That's where the soul comes in. It's the, it's works with the images. It, it produces 
the the concept that the the mind turns into an image and and then the spirit will absorb it and the attention is the conduit or the wire that drains that negative identity okay so by the time she was done this father who she'd hated for decades was now i don't care about him and it happened within half hour wow. and it's permanent it lasts it lasts forever it's that that negative identity is gone it's no longer controlling her mm. okay so it's, sometimes i can't get that far because of the entities you guys deal with you know if they're if they're moderate or or mild i can usually get past them but the the ones like i referred to you those are ones i can't get past so i can't do anything until you do something mm. it's know. so important to heal the trauma isn't it the roots if, the if you don't trauma. do it it stays forever yeah you yeah. know and that's what causes the schizophrenia you talk to these schizophrenics and they're 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 traumatized they're totally traumatized so uh it's trauma after trauma after trauma you know yes. in, until these these voices start coming in so these negative identities they go from being you know a, 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 a mind virus to after they're a, every time they're activated they get stronger you know so every time this person you hate shows up in your life and you react to them you get a, a stronger reaction to them there they are again they're, they're screwing my life up again here comes another one you know until it becomes like a part of the person believes it's part of their personality yeah. they can be gotten rid of permanently in a very short time you know and they don't they don't recreate them again after they know how much trouble that they it's caused them you know because they they threaten their survival you know so all this all this garbage that the uh psychiatrists are doing it ought to be replaced by mace you know so but what they did is they took this program to one of the universities in Australia, where the guy who invented it was a ship captain. He had nothing to do with psychiatry, had nothing to do with psychology, had a clean slate. He was a genius. He was an avid reader and studier of philosophy and energy. And, and he, he pieced this thing together. And he struggled with the last piece was where does the where are where do these these traumas get buried you have to locate them you have to find them you know and and that was the, the hardest piece is where are they buried because you've got to you find got to find them and that's where the spirit comes in you know the spirit will find them through the image wherever it's buried they it will bring that image forward and that's that's where they are mm -hmm. so and it works it works amazing I, I i just can't believe how well it works and it it cures mental disorders permanently very quickly yeah. and where do you find most of the traumas in the body jerry is there one particular place or just all over well i, I don't deal with the chakras like maybe you guys do you know i, I know uh what's her name um laura um, Laura, yeah, Laura, she, she's, a, she's the master at that, you know, when, when I, I did a session with her and I did feel, I did feel a big difference because I, I was telling her like, Hey, I, I've been on the front lines forever. You know, if anybody's infested with these things, I am, but I, I couldn't tell. I, I know I didn't have a lot of energy. I mean, I, I struggled with energy and she was like, you know, argue with them. It was like one after the other, after the other, after the other. She said, I think she said she never saw anybody that had as many as I was carrying around. And uh, I, th I think one of them said he was sent to destroy me. Mm -hmm. Another one said we were sent to shut him up, but we, he won't shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but I could feel a significant difference after she, she did that, you know, and she was dealing with the individual chakras. I deal with the, the, uh, computer virus in in the mind you know that that the energy flows up through these negative identities and it completely colors the person's perception of the planet and and their own selves so once you get rid of those things and and these entities that you guys deal with feed off of of these things being triggered you know yeah. so they'll once they're triggered they'll come in and they'll pour gasoline on the fire is is mace kind of similar to what we do in a session you know if a memory comes up like that where there was trauma in their childhood memory any kind of memory you know we'll take and reframe that memory reframe that picture 
by flooding it with white light and releasing those emotions that were tied to that and changing it. Is it kind yeah. of similar? It's kind of similar. Okay. And, but I, I think it's a, a lot more specific and, and you can, you, you get the feedback right away based on kind of some of the stuff that they, they tell you back, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I think it would be more precise and it, it'll go after specific ones that, that kind of come up and those are chosen by them. Yeah. You know, they, they, they come up by them and you just keep removing them one after another until they're all gone. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's an energetic therapy. It's not nothing like traditional psychotherapy. Yeah. So, Kaz, Kaz is the queen to that is releasing emotions. Yeah. Take care of childhood trauma. You get a lot of those. I do yeah. get a lot of those. Yeah. yeah. And it's um, amazing how something that happened when they're six or seven years old has completely destroyed their lives. Or younger, Jerry, for me, it's between two and three. Oh, wow. I keep I... going back and I keep going back and I keep going back till they're babies. Wow. Mm -hmm. And they can and remember it's... that. Not in a session, they can remember it. Um, and it's usually to do with abandonment or not being seen. Ultimately, yeah. that's what it goes back to when you're small. Something that seems very insignificant to you as an adult um, caused a lot of pain when you were a young child. Yeah. Yeah. I never cease to be amazed by the the, the stuff that comes up that I, I wouldn't even think twice about as being traumatic, you know, mm -hmm. but for them, it was very traumatic. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, it's, we're in a, and we're in a state of hypnosis basically until around about seven years old. So in order to get back to that trauma, you almost have to go into hypnosis to get there in a way to reset it, wouldn't you? Well, I, I usually put them through some relaxation exercises before I, I go into it, you know, and so, kind of so kind of get them calm down and, and relax some deep breathing that not as not as uh, significant as you guys do. I mean, not not a full hypnotic state that way. But boy, when they come out of it, they're like, you know, what happened? Where was I? You know, it's like <laughs> I, I, they just I remember this a couple of times. They're just like looking around. It's like, what what just happened? What, what you know? And I ask them, how do they, how do you feel? And they, they're like feeling for how they feel. You know, it's like something's gone. You know, there's a weight. There's a weight off my chest. It, yeah. It's gone. You know, they ask him, well, okay, how do you, how do you feel about your father now? I don't, I don't care about him. It's gone permanently, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, so we're, we're both working in the energetic field, you know, and that's where it's got to go. Yeah. You know, because they're not curing anything with these drugs. I mean. It... I feel like that's what you were talking about, Kaz, earlier before we started, um, the, the ones that we create based on the traumas we experience, the entities that we create ourselves. Well, that's, that's been my experience is that when yeah. children have a trauma, they create an entity that protects that child. And, and it does a good job protecting that child. Mm. But then it sets up programs in a person's life. Oh, really? And then we get to a stage when we're an adult, we don't need that protection. You know, this entity will be like, stay away. You're going to get hurt. They're going to abandon you again. They'll give you all these negative programs. Um, and quite often my clients are, are sad to say goodbye to these entities because they've yeah. protected them their whole life. They created how, how, how do they protect them? Well, as a child, say you were abandoned by your mother, it will, it will protect them in a way to avoid relationships with other women because they might get hurt, they might get wounded. Oh, okay. Um, and that just occurs again and again throughout their life. Hold you back. Yeah. Hold you back from experiencing your life because there's always an underlying fear of that trauma is going to happen to me again. Yeah. See, that's what we call a negative identity. Mm. Right. You know, but, you know, we've, we've got to get these these energetic therapies going here, but you look at what's happened in the United States, you, the, the, the traditional mental health center, this, this drug fueled merry-go-round, you know, of, of traditional treatment, you know, there's over, over 3 million people in the U S or 1% of the population is seriously mentally ill. You know, they're, you know, 
last year in, in the United States, there's 46,000 Americans killed themselves. Suicide. In Vietnam, there were 50,000 people that died in a 10 year period. You know, third, every year there's as many people killing themselves in the United States as died in Vietnam. You know, 24 veterans a day are killing themselves. You know, between 1999 and 2019, there was a 33% increase in the suicide rate. You know, but the, this the, this whole place that we're in, Jerry, too, is set up for trauma. It's trauma from when you're a small child, and it's just trauma all the way through. Um, yeah, yeah, but look what they're 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 treating all, all that with these drugs that don't work. Yeah, you know, the, the 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 drugs that they're using for I mean, like I, I think we mentioned that with psychotics, it actually shrinks their brains. You know, and when when these people doing the autopsies found that, I mean, and they're then they're feeding them for, with kids too. I mean, they're they're just pumping them into kids by the. Uh, I have this statistics somewhere here. Yeah, as of 2017, over a million kids in the U.S. under the age of six were on psychiatric drugs. Mm. Okay, 620 more than 622,000 were under the age of five. 80,000 were on amphetamines or ADHD drugs. Mm -hmm. You know, over 38,000 were on antidepressants. Over 85,000 were on antipsychotics. Now these are kids; these are children on antipsychotic drugs that is rotting out their brains, mm. doing permanent physiological damage. It's all about the money. You know, th over 389,000 are on anti-anxiety anti drugs. The antidepressant market in the US is expected to reach $15.98 billion by 2023. And they're curing nothing. Money. They're making a fortune. This is all about money and control. Global antipsychotic sales hit 14.54 billion in 2021 and is expected to reach 15.5 billion by 2022. We're talking billions of dollars on drugs that don't cure anything, that don't don't do anything but tamp down symptoms. No. Yeah. It's a it's an endless psychiatric merry-go-round that that flee and, I, and I've worked in the private psychiatric hospitals, you know, th these drugs have such awful side effects that these people go off them. So they come into the psych hospital, they're put on these drugs, they go off them eventually, they go psychotic, they come back in again, and every time they come in, they're fleeced for like $10,000. That comes out of uh, insurance that increases our insurance rates for medical care astronomically, comes out of the government pays for it, somebody pays for it, and it just goes round and round and round and round. You know, they go off their meds, they come back in, they're put back on again until they end up in prison. They end up in prison, you're still paying for it, you know. But you, you look at the, you know, the, what is it, this? Let's look at the, the rate of suicide for psychiatrists. I think you'll find that interesting. So th these, these guys come out with these diplomas going, yeah, we're the high priest. They mm -hmm. control virtually all the mental health facilities, you know, they're the ones that are given the power because they're supposed to have known something. Nothing they do cures anything, all right? Now, the, the National Institute of Mental Health estimated that 4.9% of people with schizophrenia die by suicide. So their suicide rate is five to 10 times that of the general population. So they're not a stable population. So, you know, you, you can pretty much size up the stability of a population by their suicide rate. It says something about them. When you take a look at the high priest of uh, psychiatry, the, these people who run our mental health centers and our mental health system, the, the whole Western mental health system for sure. The Journal of American Medical Association said the suicide rate for psychiatrists is 65 out of 100,000 or five point times higher than that of the general population. Okay. And it's equivalent with that of schizophrenics. So the suicide rate of psychiatrists is, is about equal to that of schizophrenics. You know, the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry in 1980 did a five-year study of 18,730 consecutive physician deaths by suicide and found that psychiatrists suicide regularly year by year at rates more than twice those expected, and the differences were statistically significant. 
So these people who run the Western mental health system, who we give the power to, to run all our facilities, these are the people who we're talking about. And then you talk about their popularity, you know, how they get along with their patients. Assaults for all jobs in, in a study of 120,000 assaults from 1987 to 1992, over five years reported assault rate for all jobs was 12.6 per, per, per 1,000. The assault rates for doctors other than psychiatrists was 16.2 per 1,000. The assault rate for custody staff who work on psych wards, these are, they're around psychotic patients all day long, 24 hours a day, is 69 per 1,000. The assault rate for psychiatrists is 65 per 1,000 or 5.9 times higher than the general population. Wow. And much higher than any other uh, doctor. And I noticed that when I was working at the state hospital, the psychiatrists were getting popped all the time. It wasn't the psych nurses, it wasn't the psychologists, it wasn't the counselors, it wasn't the, you know, you expect the, the attendant staff, they're gonna be fighting with them all the time. They were assaulting the psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. I, I think one, one part of that was their arrogance. You know, that's, <laughs> the, the second part was uh, uh, they, 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 they're just not curing anybody. You know, the image of a, one, of the, one of the patients one time in, in one of the psychiatric units, to, to tell you the, the, the angst between the psychiatrist and the patients. One day I, I come into work and uh, my friend calls me. He says, you got to come over here and see this. And I said, what is it? He said, you can, you can come over. He worked in another psychiatric unit. So I ran over there and he took me to the psychiatrist's office. And this psychiatrist he had introduced me to once before. And they didn't have the highest level psychiatrist at the state hospital. So this guy acted like Sigmund Freud. He had a pipe like Sigmund Freud. He smoked it like Sigmund Freud. He had a, a jacket like Sigmund Freud. He carried himself like Sigmund Freud. I mean, he was such a bizarre character, but he was, he was the psychiatrist who ran this unit. You know? So it took me to this guy's office and in the middle of the psychiatrist's desk is this fetid pile of shit that was shaped into a pipe. Wow. Now, they told us in college that uh, psychotics didn't have enough rationale or enough reasoning ability uh, to accomplish anything significant. This That's patient true. who did that <laughs> was on the third floor of this unit. He had got down to three floors without being caught by any of the, any of the staff. He somehow broke into this psychiatrist's office, crapped in the middle of his desk, shaped it into a pipe and escaped and they never found him. Wow. That's they cool. tell me they can't, they, they don't have enough mentation to uh, uh, rationalize or think things out. You know, that was another lie that uh, kind of hit me. Mm. Jerry, I wanted to ask you, as you were talking to patients and they were hearing the voices, do you did you notice their voice changing and then you were speaking to these entities or was it always they were just telling well, you what the voice is? Good, good, good question. So for 15, 20 years, it was, it was, they were hearing the voices. They would, the, the voices would tell the patient and the patient would tell me. So it went on like that for 15 or 20 years. Never was it me talking directly to them like you guys do. You know, I, I felt like I wasn't supposed to do that for some reason. Um, but, but what happened was the more of these patterns that I found, I, was, I started thinking like, what would happen if I started throwing monkey wrenches in these patterns? You know, what would happen, you know, if, 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 if I were to disrupt their patterns? So all of a sudden, what happens is all these, all these men that I was working with who had agreed to tell me in real time what was happening with the voices in the office. They started telling me the voices don't like what you're doing. They don't like you messing with those things. They don't like the homework you're giving us because I would give them homework that would disrupt the patterns. And then I'd bring them in a week later and said, how did it go? All of them were reporting the voices don't like you. They don't like the patterns. They didn't want me to come here. They don't want you. They, they don't like this. 
They don't like what you're doing. So I went, well, if they don't like it, I'm on the right path. You give them more of the same. So here, the, here were these guys getting better and better. The voices were coming less and less often. They were less and less intense. They were less and less frequent. And, and uh, you know, so, so they were getting better, you know. And uh, <clears throat> one or two of them actually fully recovered. You know? So I'm like, okay, I'm on the right path. So one of these guys that I was working with, he comes in after we finished the session, he turns around in the doorway and he looks right at me and he goes, you know what you're doing is dangerous, don't you? And I looked at him and I like, I, I'd never thought of that. I never, never crossed my mind. You know, I went, well, the voices are in their heads. They, they can't come out and get me, you know, I'm like, there's, but it was like a warning. So it's like, something I tucked in the back of my head, but I, I didn't much worry about it. It didn't affect me. It didn't affect anything I was doing. Okay. And then let me see, it was the same guy comes in a couple of weeks later. Okay. And he's getting better and better. And he knocks on my door without a pass. And he goes, the voices want to talk to you. And I'm going, they want to talk to me personally. That had never happened before ever. In, in 15, 20 years, it had never happened. I'd never talked to them directly. He goes, yeah, they want to talk to you personally. So uh, I, I bring him in, I sit him down, close the door. And I'm like, uh, okay, <laughs> well, what do they have to say? And out come these words, I'll never forget them. It said, you have no right to interfere with our way of life. Wow. And it was like, boom. <laughs> I was like... You know, because I didn't want to believe that these things were negative entities. I mean, I, I had overwhelming amount of, of evidence to, you know, toward that, but I didn't want to believe it. I, I just, I was in denial. My, my denial system was in, in tatters. I mean, it was, it was hanging together barely when that happened. And when that happened, it just collapsed. It just, it just completely collapsed. And I went, they are entities, you know, and it was like, it, it blew me away. I was, I was like shocked. You know, I closed my office that day. I didn't see any more patients. I was like trying to get over this. They are entities. I didn't want to believe they were entities. I didn't know what I was getting into. I didn't have any cognitive map of what to do with these things. There, there was no Baldwin. There wasn't any, you know, uh, Tony. There wasn't anybody. And I couldn't tell anybody anything. I couldn't talk to anybody. You know, I could imagine if I went to my boss and hey, the guy's voices are telling me that I have no right to interfere with, you know, uh, he'd probably say, yeah, you don't have any right to get stop doing whatever you're doing, you know, kind of. So I, I couldn't talk to him. I couldn't tell anybody. So I had to keep that to myself. So that same guy um, called him in, you know, a few weeks later, but I was reading a book by Miguel Ruiz, the, the uh, voice of knowledge that was talking about these things being parasitic entities and i was already expecting uh, and uh, suspecting that by this this time that that incident i told you at the jail hadn't occurred by then so i was i was suspecting it but i didn't have any actual proof and like i did when that, that thing happened in the jail so i what i did is i would ask these guys questions all the time i would bring books in i'd say what do you think of this what do you think of that what do you think is happening here what you know constantly battering them with questions so I brought this book into the uh, into the prison, and I asked uh, this guy came in. I said, "I want your opinion on on this. What what this this guy's a shaman. I want your opinion on what he has to say." So uh, I started reading, and I got to the part where he was talking about these entities being parasitic entities, and I I look at him like for for a response, and he's sitting there like a zombie. His eyes are glazed over, and he's just staring at me. You know, and I'm like, what is going on with him? I mean, it was just eerie, you know, and I'm like, uh oh, I'm in trouble. So I, I pushed my chair against the wall thinking that he's going to attack and uh, get ready to be attacked. I was going to kick him back because they only had female guards in the medical unit at that time. They, they would have been no use at all. And uh, so all of a sudden behind my back, I hear this crackling sound, just like an arc welder. It was just as loud as an arc welder. You know, crack, 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 crack. It sounded like an arc welder. And it's just crackling. And I'm like, what the fuck is happening? You know, and I, I look and I hear it going up the wall to my right. 
it's crackling up the wall. You hear crack, 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 all the way at a 45 degree angle over the right hand wall. I look at him and he's still staring at me. And I said, do you hear that? And he just stared, he's just staring with this zombie stare. He's just staring back at me. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, outer limits time. It's like, woo, what's it? You know, it's crackling, crack. It cracks all the way up to the ceiling. And this, is, this isn't just a short burst. This is going on for like over a half a minute or so. And then it crackles over his head. And now I can I can keep a watch on him and I can see the I can see the crackling. I can't see it, but I can follow it also. It's crackling along the top of the office wall building. I can't see anything, I can't smell anything. You know, there's there's nothing there except this crackling sound. And it was loud. And then it starts coming down the left wall right near me. And it crackles down that left wall and I'm looking at him and, and trying to see something and it jumps into this Rubbermaid can trash can by my left leg and it's crackling down there. And I look and there's nothing in there. There's nothing there. And I'm just, I'm blown away. I'm like outer limits time. And then he starts moving, but slowly, thank God. Cause I was weirded out by then. And he stands up slowly and he goes, I gotta leave. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, get the hell out of here. Go, go, get away from me. Don't, you know, and he shuffles out and disappears. And I'm like, I mean, I was just blown away. I was like in La La Land. It was like outer limits. I start examining the walls. I don't see any burn marks. I look all around the office. There's nothing that would account for that noise. I go out in the hall to see if there was anything to account for that noise. The doctors and nurses aren't in yet. The only person there is the guard up front. There's nothing that would account for that noise. Nothing. I, I, I was so afraid of that guy that I didn't call him back for like three months, maybe four. <laughs> Finally, my, my curiosity got the best of me. And I, I had the guards bring him down. He came in, he sat down, he looked good. You know, I thought he was going to be a wreck. I thought he would be destroyed. You know, if the voices were so strong that they could do that, I thought they would make mincemeat out of him. So, you know, the first thing I said is you look good. You know, he you know, said, what, what What are you doing? He says, well, I'm doing what you taught me. I haven't got rid of them, but I've able to keep them at bay. Mm -hmm. You know, so he looked good for, you know, for, for something like that happening. And so we did some small talk. And then finally I asked him, I said, the last time you were in here, did you hear that crackling? And he said, yeah, I heard it, but I, I'm surprised you did, me. And wow. uh, uh, I said, you know, what in the blazes was that? He said, it was them. I said, them who, the voices? He said, yeah, that was the voices. And I said, what in the hell were they trying to do? He said, they were trying to scare you off. Scary. I said, well, they did a damn good job of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, 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 I talked a little bit more and I said, uh, you know, when you got up and you walked out of here, you looked mighty strange. I said, what were they telling you when you walked out of my office? He said, they were telling me to go get a shank and stick it in your gut. Wow. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, they, he wouldn't do that. You know, I, I've been working with him for six months. He was getting better. He wouldn't do that. And I, I said, uh, okay, well, why didn't you do it? And he said, I couldn't find one and nobody would give me one. You know, it was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so. They were strong strong voices yeah. yeah so after a while i i i got to talking to them just just out of curiosity you know the voices um you know i read baldwin's book and saw i was able to walk some of them out into the light but there's there's some that just refuse to leave and mm -hmm. you know what i did learn is um what what the patient or what even i do, i vividly imagine actually happens to them on that other side. So the last 10 years of my employment, I was working in hospital emergency rooms doing side crisis. And the police would bring these guys in off the street. They'd be just floridly psychotic. Uh, and the voices would be so strong that I couldn't get through to them. So uh, I remember one time trying this out. I, I imagined very vividly that the voices, their, their, their mouths were covered with duct tape. You know, so I, I would imagine that to shut them up. And I would ask the patient, I said, uh, okay, did they shut up? And and I remember one of them said, 
Yeah, they're not talking anymore, but they're going mm, 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 yeah, just like they had duct tape <laughs> on their mouth. But that worked for me really? in the ER. Now, the mm -hmm. other thing I found in the ER is they didn't want you to help people in there. They wanted you to get these these psychotic people out of the ER so they could get medical patients in because the medical doctors had no idea what to do with them. So they just wanted them out of the ER. And, th and that was our job to somehow get them out, and find a place to, to put them or admit them one or the other. You'd have to get the psychiatrist's permission to do the admission. They actually did the admission. Um, but in order to, to get the information, you need to get past the voices. And they were raw. They were coming in on drugs. They were coming in on alcohol. They were coming in in worse shape than you guys ever dealt with them. They were, they were raw. They were floridly psychotic. And I found that worked. You know, Also, if you imagine that the voice is being struck by lightning, <laughs> they're actually getting struck by lightning over there you know but it doesn't last very long mm -hmm. you know so it's it's one of the tactics i tell these guys that they can use against these things yeah. yeah one of the worst ones i had and it was one of the first sessions i ever did was a lady who lived with a alcoholic meth addict and oh, she boy. had an entity in her throat and uh she was calling me all kinds of cuss words and her voice was just evil. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually we put this thing in a net in her throat. And as we pulled it out, she was vomiting and, and oh, choking wow. just to get this up and out of her throat. Um, yeah. And that was one so, of the worst ones I've ever, ever dealt with. I've never dealt with anything that demonic. I've so, had so one like that multiple wow. times getting sick in a session so so you said we pulled it well, out I of just, her throat yes i just got her to imagine it was in a net yeah and then it got her to imagine it was coming out so okay and as she did that she was vomiting i had to get her to make sure she was on her side and yeah what what do you guys do with the ones that just won't won't budge i mean there was one i was working with where you know we talked uh you know, talked one of the lesser ones into the light and, and it some came, got him, he disappeared. But the one they the ones that were staying, they were darker and they wouldn't budge. They they wouldn't, you know, they real they, they were miserable. They admitted that they were miserable, you know, that they were being sucked dry, that they were having to give some of their energy to some other entity. You know, they knew all these things, but they would not budge. They did not want to leave. What do you do with those kind of I kind of liken it to a hostage negotiation, trying to get that, the angle that trying to help them to make that decision. So they go get more information, trying to just talk them, talk them out basically. Well, with, well what more do you say? With, I mean, with love and compassion, just talking them out. Well, they're, they're already miserable. Mm -hmm. You know, they already know they're under control. They already know that they're, they're a slave. Yeah. You know? And, and they, yet they don't want to come out. And, and this this one was persistent. He he wasn't going to move. I usually have the angels show them a vision or what they're gonna what their journey is gonna look like or possibly look like if they detach and move and get healed and go back to the light where they come from. And usually when they see that, they remember what they came from, and they're ready to get out and they're ready to go. Usually. Now, do but you have that, anything past that? If that fails, just, I think. Go ahead, Anna. I think you have to also empower the person that you're working with to know that they are stronger. I mean, it may be different with the types of people that you're working with, but you empower your client to know that they are stronger than what is attached, that they also have free will and that entity is infringing upon their free will. Uh, so okay. when you empower them, you help them learn how to remove it because they have the ability to cast it off of themselves. They just don't know that they have that. So, and, and how do you tell way. them to do that once you? Just walking them through stepping into their power and understanding that that entity does not have a right to be there feeding upon their energy. Mm 
Uh And they have to almost stand up to it and say no more. Because it's almost like Kaz said, um, you do have entities that think that they're supposed to be there like, or, or they were used as a a protection. And so sometimes the client doesn't want to let them go either. Um, If we don't have the client stand up and empower themselves, it's as if the entity's like, nope, I can stay. So you kind of have to work both angles sometimes working with the entity itself, but also empowering your client to say no more. I do not allow you to be in my energy field. I do not allow you to be within my body. I am taking back control. Now, but what, per- what percentage do they do they come back once once you clean them of these things? Do, do they come back? It's all dependent upon their frequency and if they stay in a high frequency place or if they fall back into old patterns and behaviors and open themselves back up for that mm-hmm. entity to attach. I kind of feel like the same entities won't be coming back in, but right. but different others, ones. Other, but different ones would. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this lady I was telling you about, I was like, you just need to move out of that house. You need to get away from this guy that's addicted to meth and oh, alcohol. Yeah. Because you know, he's I, I, just going to keep bringing those things back in. You know, in the prison, you know, when meth started coming on and these these prisoners started flooding the prison these meth addicts i mean meth has caused more people to go psychotic that it, it, somehow it just opens them up i mean and there's you know they use this stuff they get high they feel like superman they feel great and and then they have these you know the hallucinations they call them where the voices are are talking to them and they go oh yeah they're just hallucinations when i come down they'll go away and they do for a while you know, sometimes for a good while. And then one day they don't, they're there and they're just as psychotic as any of the other crazy patients on the, on the psych ward. You know, and you know, what's interesting I saw was that they, they see these shadow people. And, you know, when I heard about the shadow people, I was like, Mm -hmm. really, you know, it's like, what, what is, what's this coming on the scene now? So I was always very curious, like, okay, now what's this? What, what are these shadow people? So I started asking them questions about the shadow people. Um, and, and it's, it's like the meth allowed them to see them or it brought them on, you know, and what the prisoner said was that if, if they noticed the shadow people and they called them the tree people, they said a lot of times they were sitting in trees. And mm-hmm. they could see them in the trees. And if they if they put their attention on them, they said the shadow person would start moving toward them. You know, and I'd ask them, uh, you know, what happened when they got there? And none of them hung around long enough for them to get there. <laughs> they yeah. all took off. You know, but there was one one time uh, where he, I was asking him, he was a meth addict, and I was asking him his experience with them. And he he ran an interesting experiment with him and his a meth head friend of his. So they they were wondering what would happen if they went out to the desert and one of them shot up with meth and the other one didn't. Would they both still be able to see the same shadow people? You know. So they drove to this um, Indian reservation, you know, sixty miles south of here in the middle of nowhere. They took a truck out there at night. Mm. drying out <laughs> so one of them shot up and w- what they do is they they <clears throat> the guy who shot up was started seeing them so he'd ask the other guy well there's one over near that cactus over you see him what's he doing no i don't see him so they did that a few times and the guy who didn't have the meth couldn't see them so then the other one shot up and they wanted to know if they would be seeing the same one so when I heard about this experiment, I mean, I was all ears. The other one shot up and then, yeah, they, they were both seeing the same one. You see that one over near the tree there? What's he doing? Uh, he's moving to the left. Yeah, yeah. So they compared notes and they were seeing the same the same one, both of them. You know? But while they were doing that, they were all moving in on them. So they had they had them encircled. And here's like a hundred of these shadow things all moving in toward them. And they looked and they freaked. They get, went in their truck and they uh, they slammed the door, locked it, closed all the windows. And they're sitting in the truck watching these things. And they're moving in on them. And uh, 
Then he said the back of the truck went down like this giant oh, boulder no. was dropped in there and the front <laughs> went up. And that got my attention because I didn't, I thought they were like ghosts or something. I didn't think they could affect physical reality. When he said mm -hmm. that, that the back of that truck jerked up like there was a giant boulder in there, I went, well, maybe these things can affect physical reality. So that freaked me out a little more because I was, you know, I was probing into the these you know, psychotic minds all the time. I'm yeah. like, okay, what's in there? You know, and what's in there? Can it come out? <laughs> and we're, we know it can. Yeah. You know? yeah. So uh, they, I asked them, well, what'd they do? And they said they gunned the truck and they shot out of there. They said they almost wrecked a truck getting out of there. Yeah. You know, and I asked them, did they follow you out? And he said, no. Mm. Wow. And then the, uh, the worst one I ever saw was in the emergency room. And this was on a Christmas Eve. I got, I had to work Christmas Eve in the emergency room. It was pretty quiet. Um, there, there were you know one or two people in there. It was just very, very low. Then all of a sudden this meth addict comes in and he's shaking like a leaf. You know, he couldn't stop shaking. He's, he's just, da, da, da. so I bring him in, start taking a look into what was going on with him. He said, I've been injecting meth for over 10 years. And that got my attention up. I'm like, you should have been dead five years ago. <laughs> Why are you still here? <laughs> so I started asking him all these questions. You see the shadow people? Yeah, I see them. You know, um, you ever see their eyes? So their eyes are either red or lime green if they see their eyes. And mm -hmm. if they see their eyes, they're in much worse shape than if they don't see their eyes. So the ones who just see, you know, black faces are not in as bad a shape as the ones who see their eyes. I, I actually use that as a clinical indicator to measure how, for, how, how far gone these, some of these guys were. So he said, well, I see their eyes. They're, they're either red or lime green. You know, I didn't tell him that. He knew it and matched. And I said, uh, just out of curiosity, because he, he'd been dealing with them so long, I said, have you ever spoken to them? And he said, yeah, I have. And he was the first one I've ever heard who did. And I said, well, what did they sound like? And he said, well, it sounds like, you know, you're screeching your fingers on a blackboard. You know, it's a high pitched squeal. And he he tried to mimic it. And just even the mimic sound just gave me the willies, just just listening to how he mimicked it. And uh, I, I started asking him, uh, you know, what, what, what did they have to tell you? Or what did they say? And, and then his eyes just went black. I mean, just like two dark black holes that just went to infinity. He stopped shaking and it completely went still. And I just felt this cold hatred pouring out of him. I mean, it was the coldest, darkest hatred I've ever felt in my life. I've never felt anything like that. You know, and I've dealt with a lot of psychotic patients, nothing like that. It was the coldest, darkest hatred I've ever seen. And you can't freak out. You can't look away. So I had to steer this thing in the eye, you know, for as long as it took. And it was like forever. It felt like it was absolutely forever. And then finally, it went away. And I'm like, oh, thank God. And he starts shaking again. And, and the original guy shows back up, you know, with the same tone of voice and, and everything, you know. And I'm like, whoa, you know, but... I wanted to I wanted to know what they told him because none of them ever talked before. I never heard one that spoke to anybody and told it anything. So uh, I, I started doing that question again. And I said, uh, what did they tell you? And he said, they went, they told me to go out and jump into traffic and I wouldn't be hurt. And I said, well, did you do it? He said, yeah, I did. I jumped in front of uh, a car and a truck. And I said, what happened? And he said, when I came to at the side of the road, he said, they were all standing around me and they said, get up, you're not hurt. Wow. And, he, and he said, I got up and I wasn't hurt. And they said that they told me to do it again. I did it again. And the same thing, I got up and I wasn't hurt, you know, and I don't know what the poor guy who they, he jumped in front of the truck. Maybe he ran away or something after that. I don't know. But uh, then I went to ask him another question and that thing came back again. You know, same thing, the dark eyes, the, the, he went stark still again. And here was another staring contest. And it's like, this is how long is this going to go on for? Because it was like you were looking at the devil himself. It, it was just pure evil. You know? 
and then after after a while it it just blinked out again that that dark eyed thing was gone and he started shaking again and i said okay i've had enough no no more questions that's enough so i sent him back and i was writing up my report and the psych nurse who also has to do a report on these same guys she comes in like 10 minutes later she said i can't deal with this guy what did you get what did you get you know so she didn't even want to talk to him she couldn't even she couldn't even deal with him wow those are some amazing <laughs> stories <laughs> so we could cut we could talk all day yeah. <laughs> we're right on the two hours i just look at the time and i didn't realize we went two hours yeah we, just went like that huh? we we probably should we probably should cut it yeah. what one thing i we we missed a question up there too which i think it got answered in our talk but one thing is what can people do if they're experiencing voices what do you what do you recommend? Well, I think the first Close thing the is to realize that they are not them. Mm -hmm. You know, that those voices are not who they are because the voices want them to believe that the voices are them because we're all told from the time we're children, whatever thought comes into your head belongs to you. That's way wrong. You know, that's way wrong. You know, it, Swedenborg says none of your thoughts belong to you. They either belong to negative spirits or positive spirits. You know, they come in through your affection, then through your memory, and then they appear as thoughts in your mind. You know, so they have to realize that those that those thoughts don't belong to them. They're separate from who they are. And the and the voices don't want them to realize that because I've had scores of patients ask them, who are you? What are you? And they'd say, we are you. You know, the next thing they hate the 23rd Psalm, start praying the 23rd Psalm. And ask their guardian angels for help. You know, psychiatry is only going to drug them. They're not. They're. They're not going to go away. Contact somebody like us. You know that. Uh, you know you you. There, there's. I think there's 150 MACE practitioners out there now and growing. Mm -hmm. So they can take off where you guys leave off. They can clean out the rest. Mm -hmm. Let everybody know where they can find you. And if they're needing some help, how can they well, work with you? Um, they can they can hit me at jerrymarzinski.com. That's that's my website. Um, they can write me at uh, jmarz1 at outlook.com. Uh, and they can, you know, they can also look at get this book here that Sherry and I wrote. Now, Sherry heard voices when she was little. This will talk about the voices, what they are, how they operate, and some of the things you can do about them. You know? And it also talks about psychiatry's failure to deal with what we're dealing with. Amazing. And you can Brilliant. get that at all the bookstores? Well, they can get it from Amazon. They can get it from uh, lulu.com. Mm -hmm. um, There's a link in the description about okay. where, where you oh, can perfect. get that book on uh, Amazon. Got so. It. And then I, I guess, um, where are you at other than YouTube since you're in YouTube jail right now? Well, yeah, to YouTube jail. <laughs> I'm on BitChute. I'm on um, uh, Rumble. I'm on, uh, oh, what's that? Uh, shoot, the other one. Odyssey, did you Odyssey. say? Odyssey. Yep, yeah, I'm on Odyssey. <laughs> uh, and and I'm, putting, I'm going up on a few other sites right now that uh, aren't as popular. Uh, but yeah, you can you can hit me on my website. There's a lot more information on Jer at jerrymarzinski.com, especially in the article section about what these things are and how they operate. You know, and uh, you can reach me through that too. Thank you so Jerry, much. This Jerry. has been amazing. Thank you it's for been sharing great talking all of to that. you guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like, it. it's, this is like the underpinnings of what you guys are dealing with. This is uh, like the 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 subcurrents uh, under, underneath what what's manifesting for you. It's yeah. layers, isn't it? Layers, layers and layers yeah. and layers. It's, it's so interesting. So, yeah. so you guys keep up the good work cuz You it, as well. They they have to they have to I mean it has to come from the bottom up. It's not going to come from the top down. Psychiatry is yeah. they're in Lulu land. Yeah. And and they're not going to they're not going to get out of Lulu land anytime in our lifetimes. You know, they got too much to lose. And so does big pharma. Yeah. They're going to do everything they can to resist us and people like us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Jerry. For thank your you, Jerry. You've been awesome. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. We'll have to do it again sometime. Absolutely. That would be great. This has been our longest show yet.
two hours. <laughs> nice. Thank you to everybody in the chat for your questions and just for saying hello. And thanks, Alice, for moderating for us. Yeah, thanks, Alice. Um, it's been awesome. Okay. Love, love you all. Bye, we'll see everyone. You see you and next remember, time. All the links are in the description, and I'll add Jerry's links uh, later in the description so you can get a hold of them too. So, all right. Love you all. Talk to you soon. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye.